One second, sorry. Okay. Um. Welcome to Material Interfaces Synthesizing Bodies Between Matter and Information, instructed by Laura Tripaldi. Um, this four session seminar introduces the core concepts and practices of contemporary nanotechnology and material science from a transdisciplinary perspective, providing a general conceptual toolbox for both scientists and philosophers. Although our material culture has privileged a view of tech technological bodies as inert, rigid, and vertically assembled, our growing understanding of materials and the rapid development of practices of nanotechnology have unveiled their ability to self-organize in complex and dynamic structures. In the face of this emerging and emergent material intelligence, establishing new and flexible boundaries between mind and body, subject and object, natural and artificial, living and non-living, has become a critical te technological and theoretical challenge. At the heart of our investiga investigation will be the concept of the interface, which designates the superficial region where bodies meet, generating complex material networks. While our use of electronic devices suggests an increasing dematerialization of the interface, the challenge of nanotechnology is building more and more extensive and complex interfaces where new material and interconnected systems can emerge. This process of dynamic assembly raises fundamental questions concerning our relationship with technology, guided by four specific nanomaterial configurations the spider web, the virus, the quantum dot, and the photogenic emulsion. We will investigate how interfacing bodies transmute matter into information. Um, and Laura Tripaldi is a PhD scholar in material science and nanotechnology at the University of Milano, Bacocca, if I said that right, um, where she worked in the design of hybrid nanomaterials in the study of the process of self-assembly for advanced technological applications Parallel to her academic research, she writes about speculative and philosophical aspects of science and technology. The particular focus on the concepts of complexity, self-organization, relation, relational ontologies, artificial intelligence, softness, and material interfaces. She's a contributor for several online magazines, her latest book, Menti Parallel, and an essay on the intelligence of materials and their entanglement with human minds will be translated into English and published by Ur Urbanomic Press in 2021. Okay. Um, yeah, so how do you want to organize the seminar, I guess? Okay, uh, so thank you for your introduction. And uh, yeah, um, so um, there will be four sessions of the seminar um, and uh, I can, I will soon uh, break it down for you. Uh, if you haven't read that already, I will explain a little bit uh, what kind of topics we will uh, um, encounter. And uh, yeah, I can start by sharing maybe my PowerPoint presentation. Um, and yeah, I think some people are um, joining still, but uh, we can start, I think. So yeah, um, let's see. Does everyone see the presentation? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, nice to meet you. Uh, I've already been introduced very well, but <laughs> again, uh, I am a PhD student in material science and nanotechnology. So um, I am a scientist. Uh, I have a scientific background, but uh, also I like to discuss and um, uh, deal with also other aspects um, outside of hard uh, science. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, well, before I start, maybe um, I think, um, so I don't know, like, uh, do we have to discuss first um, uh, the uh, division into groups of the students for the text uh, assignments? I don't really know because it's the first time I do this. So I don't really know uh, how to handle this. Um, so. Um, so I'm, I'm creating the spreadsheet right now for the presentation. Okay, so okay, good. So, all image. right, so now uh, while we discuss, then, then we figure out also, also that. All right, <laughs> great, thank you. Um, 
So yeah, um, uh, I, um, I mostly work uh, in my research with uh, nanomaterials and uh, with the self-organization processes of nanomaterials. Uh, and we will talk uh, a lot about self-organization during this four session seminar, because to me, this is really a fascinating concept, uh, not only scientifically, but also philosophically. Uh, and I use these self-organization processes of nanomaterials, and we will also discuss what a nanomaterial is um, for uh, technology. Uh, so I also am interested in uh, the way we uh, uh, deal and we interact with new technologies, and especially material technologies. Um, so by starting from this uh, very uh, technical background, uh, I ask myself some questions uh, relating to the agency of non-living materials. So whether these materials um, can um, have a sort of intelligence, they can um, have a, their, their, their ability to act uh, in the world and um, to have an impact, active impact on our everyday lives and our culture. And also I deal with the public communication of nanotechnology, uh, because as we will see throughout this seminar, there's um, some very big problems uh, in communicating nanotechnology and understanding what nanotechnology uh, is all about. Uh, and I think there are many misconceptions. And I also think that um, probably um, it is our fault uh, in, in the sense that um, we as scientists working in the field of nanotechnology are not very good uh, at explaining and communicating what we do. Uh, and um, yeah, and I think this is also a very urgent matter right now because um, as we will also discuss, um, we are living right, right now in one of the, I think, moments in history where nanotechnology now is like becoming a, an issue for everyone. Uh, and we will talk about this when we deal with viruses and we deal with also um, vaccines. Uh, and uh, for instance, the new generation of RNA vaccines, as you maybe already know, are uh, nanotechnology. Uh, and so now everyone, or most of us, uh, now uh, have come in close contact with nanotechnology. And so we have to really understand what it is all about. Um, and then another topic that I am really interested in is the intersection between feminism and experimental science. Uh, and so feminist epistemologies, uh, and what does it mean, uh, for instance, to represent a scientific object, to see a scientific object, uh, and this problem of vision uh, is very important in nanotechnology because we deal with things that by definition we are unable to actually see. So, um, so yeah, these are kind of, kind of the main topics and we will kind of deal with them one by one during the seminar. And yeah, um, uh, as has already been said, I have a book coming out for economic parallel minds and it should be out in spring 2022. And some of the things that I will talk about will of course be uh, in that uh, publication. And of course, yeah, this is my email, but you already have that but for any questions, of course, you can write me anytime. So yeah, the general topics of this seminar uh, have already been explained, but in general, I will try to offer you an interdisciplinary perspective of uh, material science, uh, now technology, philosophy, society. Um, and uh, I hope that um, you will be able to uh, gain a general idea of what nanotechnology is. Of course, I think that uh, there are many people here that do different things, probably, and I also would like to hear what uh, you guys do and what are your fields of interest. Uh, and I hope that there are people from all sorts of backgrounds, uh, because it's always more uh, stimulating, of course. Uh, so I, I guess that my uh, ambition is for you to try to figure out step by step what uh, nanotechnology is and uh, why is it interesting um, uh, and also have a kind of conversation about material culture what is material culture uh, and uh, how nanotechnology and innovation in new materials can change our material culture and so our way of, of thinking about non-living materials we will talk a lot about self-organization, as I said, self-assembly, self-organization, complexity, uh, both in natural and artificial systems. 
uh, we will discuss the interface, which is a, an interesting concept, I think, uh, that is really useful both in technology and outside of technology. Um, and uh, through the interface, we will also think about uh, the boundary between matter and information. Uh, and I think um, this is also uh, uh, an important topic uh, nowadays because we really um, uh, think a lot um, about information, about data, and we often have the feeling that these things are kind of immaterial or dematerialized, uh, but we actually um actually the all of the production of information that we deal with um is rooted in material substrate so how does uh, matter get slowly transformed into information what happens in this transition you know and to me this is really interesting to to try to think about this uh, this transition um and then of course what do we do with technology our own human relationship with these non-human strange bodies uh, that surround us. Um, and to me also, this is uh, an interesting question. So I hope that by the end of this seminar, you will have a general idea of material science and nanotechnology. And also maybe um, you would be able to uh, reflect on the relationship between the physical chemical structure uh, and properties of a material and um, its uh, meaning uh, within our human culture within society um, and also of course understand and use the concepts of complexity and self-organization uh, and maybe if you agree with me and you don't have to agree with me on this but if you do then maybe try to figure out in what way uh, a non-living material can also show uh, intelligence uh, and be able somehow to have a kind of agency or uh, so the first session is the one we will have today, and uh, um, it is about spider web, um, and uh, we will go through all of this uh, during this session. So first of all, we, I will have a general introduction about nanomaterials, what they are, uh, the, and what does it mean, so what, what is, even is nanotechnology. Uh, then we will talk in uh, detail about spider silk, which is a very interesting nanomaterial. It is, uh, I often think about spider silk as a natural nanotechnology. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting starting point. It is a very fascinating material. Maybe you, you already have heard something about it. So we will try to go a bit in depth also into the structure and the physical chemical properties of spider silk. Uh, and then uh, I will try to uh, prove the point <laughs> that spider silk is an intelligent material or that it has a kind of mind uh, and also uh, that the mind of this material is somehow entangled with the mind of the spider that produces this material. Um, then uh, we will discuss the concept of the interface, what it is, uh, what does it mean, the different meanings of the word interface. Um, we will discuss the concept of softness, um, which is a very important uh, concept for me. Um, and we will try to understand um, how the paradigm of hardness versus softness in technology uh, can um, help us to uh, change our view of technological bodies. Um, and then uh, briefly, we will talk a little bit about uh, mythology, about the myth of Arachne. Uh, and then there will be some space for your questions, of course, and some questions I have for you that I would like you to answer during this, uh, this seminar. Uh, then the second session, which is scheduled, oh, wait, the dates are wrong, but <laughs> I know that the second session is scheduled uh, for the 4th of December. Um, so yeah, sorry, I will fix this before I send you this presentation, um, which is about the virus. So for each uh, session, we will deal with a specific material. Um, and I will try to have like this um, approach where first we uh, talk about um, the physical chemical structures and physical chemical properties. So I will try to go a bit in depth into the materials that we talked about, even on a more technical level, because I think this is useful. Um, and then we will try to understand the meaning of these materials also on a more philosophical point of view. 
So the second session will deal with the virus. And of course, the virus uh, is a structure, nanostructure, natural nano, another natural nanotechnology, natural nanomaterial that really um, is, um, that really, uh, of course, has impacted our lives so much during these last two years. But I would say across the whole duration of human history. Uh, and I think from a nanotechnological perspective, the virus is interesting because it highlights the boundary between matter and information uh, in the way that the virus is a material structure that uh, delivers uh, information into our bodies, um, genetic information, right? So it, it also becomes a kind of metaphor for a certain kind of technology. So we will try also to understand the virus not only as a literal uh, body, but also as a conceptual um, uh, conceptual idea, let's say. Uh, and then from this, we will talk a bit about the history of nanotechnology, which has used the, the model of the virus to think about uh, what it means to make um, a nanotechnology. Uh, and we will discuss the processes of self-assembly, so static and dynamic self-assembly. And so we will go a little bit in depth into complexity theory, the theory of complex material systems. Uh, and we will also discuss about more philosophically about the concept of autopoiesis and self-organization of material systems. And then, uh, since this will be a natural conclusion, after discussing uh, the ability of matter to self-organize and create complex dynamic structures, then we will also discuss about the possibility of artificial life. Uh, and I will try to give you both a more general um, perspective on this and also some uh, examples of technologies today uh, that are really trying to push the boundary of the meaning of, uh, of life and what it means to recreate uh, a living system in the laboratory. Uh, the third session will deal with the quantum dot, and this is scheduled for the uh, 18th of December, but, or, or maybe, yeah, I, sorry about, the, no, the 11th of December, I think, yeah, so it's always Saturdays. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so in this session, we will talk about the quantum dot. Uh, and the quantum dot is, um, let's say, new, um, kind of new. I mean, it's not like really, really new, but it's one of the most, let's say, cutting edge nanotechnologies that already has some also commercial applications. Uh, and so we will try, I will try to tell you what is the quantum dot. We will talk about that. Um, and it is really a fascinating nanomaterial. Um, and uh, we will talk about some, um, uh, this will be, let's say, the starting point to discuss uh, about the impact of nanotechnology on society, the public perception of nanotechnology, uh, the fears uh, associated with nanotechnology, whether these fears are um, meaningful or not, and I always think that they are, of course, uh, because we really need to understand uh, why certain uh, cultural perceptions are created, what do they mean in relation to technology. Uh, and then starting from there, we will start to think about the interaction of nanotechnology with human bodies. Uh, and so nanomedicine, uh, human technology interfaces from the perspective of nanomaterials, uh, and we will talk uh, also a little bit about the nanotechnological approaches that have been used to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic um, and even, of course, advanced and uh, a bit out there ideas about, uh, about uh, human and nanotechnology interfaces. And of course, we will talk about cyborgs also from a philosophical perspective. Uh, and all of this in the, in the light of um, again, the boundary between matter and information. So um, when and how does a material structure become a vector of uh, abstract uh, information? Um, uh, so yeah, uh, th that would kind of be the, the topic of the third session. And finally, the fourth session, which will be on December 18th, I think. Um, so this one, uh, I am sorry, I haven't uploaded for this session the reading materials yet. I will try to do that by the end of next week, so in the coming days, hopefully. Um, but this uh, fourth session will deal with the photographic uh, emulsion. Uh, so uh, we are talking about 
the first um, photographic technologies, so the, the dawn of photography as a technology, and although we don't really think of it in this way, um, photography and photographic emulsions have been actually the first uh, nanotechnologies to emerge, to become really widespread. Uh, the photographic emulsion is um, based on nanomaterials, colloidal materials, which are another way to, more ancient way to define a nanomaterial. Uh, and so um, I would like to discuss the photography in the light of nanotechnology, so from this perspective. Uh, and also this will be the starting point to have a, a reflection from the feminist point of view on uh, technologies of representation. So what I would like to do is use the concept of the interface that we have developed during this, the previous uh, three sessions and try to use this concept. So this material interface um, enabled by nanotechnology and nanomaterials uh, to think about what it means to represent something, what it means to see uh, something. Um, and this is a really important thing uh, in nanotechnology, as I have said, because we often deal with invisible uh, bodies, invisible things. Um, so yeah, this is, will kind of be the topic of the, fourth, uh, of the fourth session, and yeah, I will make sure to give you the reading materials very soon also for, uh, for this one, so you can, um, so you can be prepared. Uh, and yeah, also about the reading materials, um, you will see, or maybe you have already seen, that there are some things uh, there are actually scientific papers, uh, and I don't really expect, um, and I don't think it is important for you to really understand the technicalities in the scientific papers that I uh, propose to you. Um, my idea is kind of to try to uh, show you uh, really the state of the art of uh, contemporary science or give you some historical articles that actually have been important in the development of a scientific concept. Um, so when you deal with those texts, I understand they can be maybe uh, complicated and I am open for any kind of, of question, but uh, uh, what I want to say is um, try to read them from a more general perspective, to understand the more general concepts behind them and not just uh, the, the technicalities are not really that's important. And then during the seminars, I will uh, highlight and try to explain the technical parts that I think um, are relevant to our discussion. Okay, so um, regarding the final assessment, um, so um, I think the, the way that usually is done uh, here at the new center, and I think also is a good is a good idea, is a good way to uh, elaborate on the topics of the seminar is to write um, a final uh, text um, of uh, approximately 2,000 words. Uh, and what I would like you to do, um, then we can also discuss this uh, more in depth in the coming sessions, is try to focus uh, as, I, as I did during, as I will do during my seminar, you, I would like you to focus on a specific material uh, and this could, does not have to be um, a nanomaterial. It does not have to be um, a technological new uh, material. It can also be um, a more everyday material. Uh, okay, so uh, for, for instance, it can be glass or it can be steel or it can be anything. Or if you want to decide on, on something else, on something more complex, it can be anything from a pharmaceutical drug to um, I don't know, a nanomaterial that you found on a paper. And I would like you to reflect on this material from um, first starting from a more physical chemical perspective. And of course, I don't expect anything um, too technical, but just to try to make a connection between the material structure and uh, its meaning, um, both from a, a historical, aesthetic, cultural, philosophical perspective. Um, so, of course, you are really free to do what you want here, uh, but maybe uh, we can use the time we have during the last session, the third and the fourth session, 
uh, if you start or even even before if you think about something and you have doubts and you want to ask me whether this can be um, interesting and talk about your ideas uh, I think it, it could be useful so maybe at the end of the of the seminar we can talk about that uh, also for everyone else so uh, we can have an open discussion about your ideas before you actually write uh, the final assignment and um, yeah so the grading um, I think the the grading procedure is that you will be graded either I, P, or E uh, based on different parameters. So the 20% is the seminar attendance. Uh, then there will be text presentations, which account for 30% of your grade. Um, and for this, uh, you will be uh, divided into groups, I think. So now I don't know how many of you are here, uh, but you will be. Uh, divided into groups of three or four people uh, and each of these groups uh, will uh, discuss a specific text relating to the topics of the seminar so you can pick from the materials I have given you there is also a list of books uh, in the syllabus uh, and I will not discuss all of those books and of course uh, they are many and you don't have to read them all uh, but maybe you like some of those materials and you want to, or some of those books and you would like to comment on a part or a chapter or whatever, uh, or also maybe you find something else that is not part of these materials that I give you, maybe an article on something that you find interesting or, and, and you want to discuss that. So I am really open here for anything that you want to do. Uh, and uh, I don't know how we will manage, but probably starting from the next seminar session, we can have I don't know, one or two, two presentations. Um, yeah, we will have to organize this based on how many you are. And uh, I think it would be interesting to have, if you agree, of course, to have these conversations for the whole group so everyone can hear what everyone else uh, has uh, been thinking about. Then there is the participation in class. And uh, at the end of each seminar, there are some questions for you, but you can also stop me at any time and ask me any kinds of questions you want, of course, uh, and the final work that I have explained to you. Okay, so this is all for my introduction. Um, I don't know if uh, we have uh, something else to say for the um, grading system. Uh, Nadia, do you have, did I forget about anything? Um, I believe that if you have a presentation, uh, what the the new grading system is if you do presentation but you don't have uh the final project you still okay. get a pass um, okay you get a pass. So that's it. okay so you can just do the presentation and uh then the final text is not is optional all right okay good thank you all right um so yeah i have uh quite a few things to talk about um, so uh, what I think is we, we can maybe go halfway through, then have a little break, uh, and also maybe have a little question time, uh, and then we finish the, the seminar. So let me know, of course, if you, if you agree with this or if there are any problems. Um, and yeah, I, I would also like to have like a short round of presentations for students, but I'm not sure if that's okay. Is that okay? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I'm gonna. I'll ask Raphael. It's my first time doing this. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it's okay. Like, or maybe if anyone then wants to ask a question before they ask the question, they can just say what they do. I'm just curious to know uh, what everyone is interested in. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, let's start with a short introduction about uh, nanotechnology and uh, nanomaterials. Um, and uh, so we so we can just. Yeah, everyone has an idea of what we are actually talking about. So uh, what is a nanomaterial? Um, and here for nanomaterials, um, we actually have to think a little bit to understand nanomaterials, we have to think a little bit about uh, size, because of course, a nanomaterial is defined by its scale. Um, so yeah, um, we are, when we talk about nanomaterials, we talk about any material. It can be natural, it can be artificial, or it can be some, somewhere in between that has um, particles or structures 
which are between the range of one nanometer or 100, between one nanometer, nanometer and 100 nanometer. So uh, we are talking one nanometer is uh, one billionth of a meter. So uh, it is really small. Um, and maybe um, we, we are talking about structures that are actually smaller than living um, organisms, even the smaller living organisms like bacteria. Um, and we are in the scale of the building block of life, let's say. So um, viruses, for instance, are in the nanometer range. Uh, the coronavirus is around 10 nanometers. Um, and proteins, uh, which make up uh, most of our structures, our bodies, of course, are in the same range. DNA, um, but also uh, it is not just living stuff. There are also nanostructures that are inorganic, uh, like minerals, uh, for instance, clays. Uh, have nanostructures. <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, there, there is a wide variety, but here in this range, um, nanotechnology has been working to produce different complex structures, uh, which really vary uh, in type and uh, composition. And so we have inorganic or organic materials um, of different kinds, and we will try to get in there and be more specific about it. And then um, you will encounter some of these uh, structures by yourself. So really to give you an idea of what the size of a nanometer of a nanostructure is, um, here are some examples for you. Um, so um, the, um, if you consider, for instance, the, DN the, the DNA uh, double helix, which is about 2.5 nanometer in diameter, um, uh, it's uh, like the distance in size between this structure and the bacterium is the same distance between the bacterium and a uh, raindrop. Uh, or if you think about a single walled carbon nanotube, which is um, in, an inorganic, artificial inorganic uh, nanomaterial, um, and we will also talk about this uh, carbon based materials a little bit more, uh, then the, this, the difference in size between this structure and the human hair. Um, is the same distance in, in size between a human hair and a house, uh, or a um, nanoparticle of four nanometers is uh, in the same relationship to an ant as an ant is to a football field. Uh, so we kind of have this, uh, it's kind of hard to visualize the size of nano things, uh, but we can also just focus on, um, let's say, the properties that. Uh, arise on a scale that is so small. So the, the, mo the most important thing um, here uh, is that um, at the scale uh, of, uh, of nanostructures, uh, some things uh, change, some properties are different. Uh, for instance, um, uh, some quantum effects that in the macroscopic scale are no longer relevant at um, the let's say at the nanoscale, they still are uh, important. And we will see this, for instance, for quantum dots. Um, we will see how quant quantum effects, of course, and the name already says that, uh, are still important for these structures. Uh, also, um, there are differences in, let's say, viscosity. Uh, so everything at the nanoscale is very sticky um, and very viscous. Um, so if you think about um, uh, a nano object swimming in uh, um, a glass of water. Uh, so for us, swimming in water is quite easy. Uh, but if you are very small, uh, you experience uh, really all the turbulence arising from the Brownian motion, so the thermal motion of the molecules inside your system uh, that really slowly slow you down and make uh, your whole experience of matter completely different. So it's different. So if you imagine being nano-sized, your experience of the world is very different. Also, you experience much stronger electrostatic interactions, uh, and for this reason, also gravity has a different impact. It can be less uh, relevant than uh, it is for us microscopic beings, uh, and all of this can also be uh, subsumed under the category of surface effects. Uh, and we will talk about surfaces a lot during this seminar. Um, but the most important concept is uh, surfaces uh, in nanosystems are really more important 
uh, and more, much more relevant than for macroscopic uh, structures. Um, and so surface effects uh, at the nanoscale become much more uh, relevant, much more significant. Uh, okay, so nanotechnology, um, when does it start? What's the origin of nanotechnology? Um, during um, lectures in uh, university for chemists and nanotechnology, always the first thing that they show you and they talk about is uh, this lecture <coughs> by Richard Feynman, uh, which is called Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And I don't know how well known this paper is um, outside of uh, scientific fields, but it is very popular. It became very popular as a kind of uh, foundational myth of nanotechnology. Uh, and I think this is interesting also because, um, yeah, like um, not necessarily like the, it's kind of, um, not really true that this uh, lecture of Feynman has influenced nano real nanotechnology so much. So this has been described as a kind of prophetic view of what nanotechnology would be, and there are some interesting intuitions, and now I will go through this lecture with you and the main points. Um, but uh, there are also a lot of really meaningless things that uh, really do not represent what nanotechnology has become. Uh, and uh, still people in the sciences like to talk about this as a founding story of nanotechnology. Maybe uh, there is also a desire to associate uh, um, a very experimental science with the name of uh, a very famous theoretical physicist. So I think there is also um, some kind of bias here um, in the attempt to find the legitimization, let's say, for a, a very experimental science uh, and trying to give it some more noble origins, let's say. So yeah, I think this is another interesting thing when talking about the history of experimental sciences, uh, because it is very different from the history of uh, theoretical physics, for example, when everything revolves around uh, the names of big men and the discoveries, great discoveries. So actually chemistry and nanotechnologies are really really different from that uh, so yeah let's break down some aspects of plenty of room at the bottom which i think will be interesting also uh, as we move through our seminar we will find again this concept so the first one uh, complexity so the um, the lecture uh, at some point during this lecture which was given in 1956 i think um uh, Feynman says um, about, he, he, he does not call this field nanotechnology because the name does not exist yet, but he says, I would like to describe a field um, in which little has been done, but uh, in which an, enorm an enormous amount can be done in principle. And this field is not quite the same uh, as the others, uh, like fundamental physics, uh, but it is more like solid state physics in the sense that it might tell us much of great interest about the strange phenomena that occur in complex situations. What I want to talk about uh, is the problem of manipulating and controlling things on a small scale. So um, here, uh, I think this is, I think maybe the most interesting intuition of Feynman in this lecture, and this is the idea that working with things at a very small scale uh, might tell us a lot about phenomena that occur in, com in complex situations. So, <clears throat> Complexity is actually uh, one of the most important aspects of, of the say, of nanotechnology, because uh, we and we will see this as we as we go on. Uh, but we in nanotechnology we often deal with a large number of bodies uh, interacting with um, a lot of complex interactions together. So complexity really is the keyword of nanotechnology. Uh, then another interesting thing uh, that Feynman talks about is the relationship between uh, nano structures or very small material st structures and information. So the first thing, the first reason why Feynman started to uh, think about this idea of working on a very small scale uh, is the possibility of writing um, a lot of information on a very small, um, on a very small area. So he literally uh, suggests uh, that we could really write uh, the whole Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of a pin, or maybe just write every book that 
humanity has ever written uh, in a very small in, in a very small scale. So the idea is um, not working on the nanoscale can really allow us to uh, include uh, a lot of information. And I think this is really interesting because it is true that nanotechnology deals with the relationship between matter and information. Uh, but what maybe is a little misleading or could be, uh, you know, um, maybe we could talk about this a little bit more is the idea that here Feynman really thinks about um, information in a very literal sense. He really thinks about writing. Um, so he is really thinking about a form of information that is very human. So the, the really um, the, the literal idea of writing a book. Uh, and in, the way nanotechnology and nanostructures deal with information is not really in this way. So there is uh, an aspect of information, but it is uh, a, maybe a different kind of information uh, that is not really uh, so closely related to human language. Uh, then there is the problem of vision and control. So uh, Feynman asks himself, um, he actually here Feynman just thinks that probably chemistry is uh, an outdated science. And he thinks maybe the problem of chemistry could be just simply resolved um, by having a very powerful microscope that will allow us to simply see uh, molecules with our naked eyes. And just uh, instead of going through all the complicated processes of chemical analysis and chemical synthesis, we could just simply look uh, at molecules and understand what they are made of and then move the atoms around and make any molecule that we want. Uh, so uh, we will discuss about this again uh, in the um, coming uh, seminar about this idea of uh, molecular and atomic manipulation. Uh, but this is really not uh, the way chemistry works and there is a reason uh, why chemistry um, needs to be the way it is. Uh, but I find in interesting this uh, problem uh, that emerges from this lecture, which is the idea of visualization. So it is clear to me that from the beginning, nanotechnology has been asking the question of what it means to see on the very small scale and what it means to control something that is very small. Um, and uh, I think, and we will see this as we go on, uh, that the problem of control in, um, uh, in the field of nanotechnology is a very important one. Uh, but we have to find alternative solutions, uh, alternative solutions compared to uh, the simple direct vision and manipulation that here Feynman is talking about. Um, then, of course, there is the problem of miniaturization. So, uh, in order to um, act and manipulate matter on the very small scale, on the nano scale, um, Feynman suggests um, that we should use um, a sort of mechanism. Um, based on a very tiny hand. So he, what he wants to do is create a sort of mechanism whereby controlling um, a series of increasingly smaller uh, hands, we will be able to uh, somehow manipulate uh, single atoms and single molecules. So again, here the problem of control emerges again, uh, and the solution that Feynman suggests is to directly move and control matter um, but um, then uh, we will see um, that uh, nanotechnology has been using uh, different approaches to the control of matter on the small scale. Uh, and actually these approaches are related to the possibility um, of um, self-organization. So exploiting the ability of matter to self-organize by itself in complex structures. So we have to give up this direct control on matter. Uh, but here, the vision that Feynman has is a vision of direct manipulation. So it's the same that we do on a large macroscopic scale. We want to do the same on the nanoscale. But of course, this is not possible and really misses the point of um, what nanotechnology then uh, would have become. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think that the kind of this kind of breaks it down um, a little bit for you, and uh, of course, then I will give you uh, the paper, and you can read it through yourself. Uh, but the idea here is um, this, of course, was a very interesting and prophetic uh, thinking by Feynman. Uh, so he understood that there was a lot of opportunity for working on the very small scale, but the way he was um, thinking about doing that 
did not really match what then would happen to uh, nanotechnology. Um, so um, actually these ideas uh, that Feynman had in the 1950s, uh, most of them have been proven wrong and uh, you will hopefully understand it as we, as we move on. Uh, but uh, in the public imagination, the idea of nanotechnology is still kind of rooted to some of the concepts uh, that Feynman has put forth. Um, and I think uh, that it is still hard to uh, figure out what nanotechnology really is and how it works. Um, so if you just Google some images uh, about nanotechnology or nanorobots or something like that, you will find a lot of these very uh, interesting uh, images um, in which you can really see that the image that we have, um, the aesthetic uh, image that we have of nanotechnology uh, really makes us visualize these very small mechanical structures. Um, so we have robots, the same that we have on the small scale, but we imagine on the large microscopic scale, but we imagine them to be very small, but still they are exactly the same. They are mechanical objects assembled in the same way. Um, they are hard, they are made of uh, I don't know, steel or maybe titanium or silicon. Uh, and also they have this kind of very um, aggressive or military feel. They are kind of the tiny war machines that um, get into our bodies and can destroy us or destroy the invaders. So there is all of this um, imagination around now technology that uh, is really interesting to me. Um, and also, uh, another thing that I find interesting is this idea, and I like this image uh, that you can find here at the bottom right of this man just looking into this microscope, and I don't know what he is seeing, but this is a, a carbon nanotube. Um, and again, um, you cannot really see a carbon nanotube in a microscope like that, but the, pro the problem to me is not really that this is inaccurate. It's more like interesting to think about um, how, how difficult it is for us to visualize something that is so small and that is so different from uh, what we usually mean uh, for a technological body. So I think nanotechnology really challenges our idea of what technology really is. Uh, and I will try to prove this to you, uh, but I wanted just to show you a little bit. And uh, I think this is, um, for me, when I started working in nanotechnology, before I started working in nanotechnology, this is kind of the idea that I had. This is what I imagined when someone told me uh, something about nanotechnology. Um, so, um, okay, so graphene. <laughs> just, uh, I will just tell you a little bit about this material because if there is one material that, uh, that you probably have heard, one nanomaterial that you probably have heard of, this is graphene. Um, and um, I remember when I started uh, my PhD uh, a few years ago in uh, nanotechnology, I had this friend uh, and he asked me, uh, sorry, but okay, now you, you do this nanotechnology thing, but uh, everyone is talking about graphene, but I don't understand uh, why graphene has not changed the, the world yet. You know, everyone says it's this mir miracle material, but uh, honestly, I haven't seen it and I don't know what it does. Um, and honestly, to me, that was kind of an eye-opening moment uh, for me um, because it made me realize of some misconceptions that I also had uh, about nanotechnology. So graphene, as you maybe already know, uh, was isolated in 2004 uh, by uh, Professor Andre Geim and uh, Kostyan uh, Novo <laughs> Novoselov, uh, sorry, at the University of Manchester. Uh, and this, um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2010 for the discovery or the isolation of, uh, of graphene. And graphene is a two-dimensional material um, made of a single sheet of graphite, and it is just composed of carbon atoms disposed in um, a hexagonal structure. Uh, so, after graphene was isolated, um, and it was isolated, as you maybe know, uh, in a very um, <laughs> let's say rudimentary way by using uh, adhesive tape, scotch tape, 
uh, on um, on a single piece of of graphite and just uh, uh, tearing off single layers of of graphite until there was just a single layer. Um, and once it was isolated, um, everyone, uh, of course, was very excited about it because graphene it does have many surprising uh, properties. Um, it has incredible electrical conductivity, thermal conductivity. Um, it is incredibly strong. Uh, it has incredible mechanical strength. So, um, of course, our imagination started to run wild and uh, there was a lot of talking about graphene uh, and how it would help us uh, to build space elevators and colonize uh, the universe and build invisible body armor um, and supercomputers and everything like that. Uh, but of course, the hype then started to become kind of uh, smaller as we realized that all of these things we would not really be able to do uh, because graphene itself, although it does have all of these properties, it does not, it cannot really be used by itself, but it really needs to be integrated um, into more complex systems, and it really does need to be used uh, in a very different way. So the most common way that now we use graphene is to integrate it with other materials to improve their properties. Um, and we really don't uh, use, use graphene as a single, um, as a single material. Um, super strong uh, or indestructible material. So um, to me, um, this kind of gives the idea of the expectations that are put on nanotechnology and that maybe when it comes to nanotechnology, we are uh, sometimes asking the wrong questions. So we tend to think uh, about nanomaterials in the same way that we think about macroscopic materials. So steel is very strong. Uh, and so we think, okay, if graphene is stronger than steel, then we will be able to use graphene in the same way that we use steel. But a nanomaterial really requires us to rethink the way we, we, we use uh, technologies and materials in a completely different way. Um, and I think this is a good example to figure that out. But then as we go, you will see other, other examples of this. Okay. Okay, so um, we have seen some misconceptions about nanotechnology, but there are maybe also some more um, uh, informed opinions. Uh, so nanotechnology um, is a relatively new science, uh, and I would say that it, it has started to really become something uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, the first issue of Nature Nanotechnology, that is uh, one of the most prestigious journals in the field of nanotechnology was published in 2006. And in this first issue, issue there were um, several scientists and science communicators um, and policymakers, and they were asked uh, about their opinion of, um, of nanotechnology. Um, and I think this is interesting. There are some interesting replies about what nanotechnology is. Uh, so we have Peter Binks uh, that said uh, there isn't just one nanotechnology, but there are many nanotechnologies. Um, and uh, it would not surprise me if the term nanotechnology disappeared uh, and the terms nanomaterials and nanobiotechnology, for example, would assume a greater currency. So I think this is an interesting point, and I think this is true uh, now after a few years after this, uh, this statement, that now we don't really talk about nanotechnology as one big thing, uh, as we used to do years ago. Uh, and now there is a tendency to focus on more specific aspects of uh, nanomaterials and their different applications. Um, I don't expect the nano hype to last very long, says Elizabeth Shepard. Um, it means too much and expectations are very high. Um, so I agree, I agree with this. So the hype around nanotechnology at first was huge, uh, and it was not really keeping the promises that uh, nanotechnology made at the beginning. Um, and uh, again, uh, the most fascinating aspects of nanoscience and nanotechnology are the properties on this length scale that are exquisitely sensitive to the surrounding environment, um, says John Bolland. And um, one could argue that it is meaningless to refer to the innate properties of nanoscale systems without 
reference to the influence of environmental factors such as surface termination, substrate interactions, electrical and mechanical context. So here again, I agree with this. I think that nanotechnology, really the most important aspect of nanotechnology is the ability of nanomaterials to interact with the surrounding environment and their capacity to be sensitive to the environment that surrounds them. And I think this, we will see this in several examples. So uh, nanomaterials actually are, most of them, not all of them, but most of them are really smart materials that can really sense the environment that surrounds them. Um, and again, this is an interesting uh, statement. It would have been called the surface science in the 60s and 70s, says Peter Dobson. And this is interesting for me because it is true that now technology is not really as new as we think it is. And we will see this maybe with the photographic emulsion. There have been nanotechnologies that um, exist, have existed for even centuries, and we didn't really think about them as nanotechnologies. But what, may, uh, what uh, all of these technologies have in common is a specific approach to um, surfaces. Uh, and again, the interface. And we will discuss about the concept of the interface uh, a little bit more in depth. OK. So after this uh, general um, view, uh, um, I think uh, the, the main question for me is uh, how do nanomaterials challenge our view of technology? Uh, and I think there are several points that we can highlight, and we will also go more in depth into this concept. But the first one, I think, is the boundary between materiality and virtuality, so, so material and virtual. Um, compared to other approaches uh, to technology, um, I think uh, that nanomaterials uh, really highlight uh, the importance of material substrates. Uh, and again, um, I think there is uh, one of the most important aspects is the boundary between um, a material structure and the information that it can somehow contain. Um, the problem of control is a very important one, I think. Um, so it is the idea that due to problems of scale, nanomaterials really challenge us to um, change the ability we uh, control material structures. So from top-down uh, approaches of controlling a, a material structure, we have to shift to a more bottom-up uh, approach. So we really have to let materials um, self-organize instead of uh, really forcing them to do what we want to do, what, what we want them to do. Another important aspect of nanotechnology is the problem of representation. Um, I think nanotechnology really challenges um, our ability to see uh, invisible things, invisible objects, and it really asks us to reflect on the meaning uh, of represent, representing uh, something. And I think this has become very uh, evident with uh, the coronavirus crisis because the representation of the virus that is a, a nanostructure has become really ubiquitous and the way we represent it is not really um, objective. It, ca it cannot be because actually being a nanostructure, the virus does not really have uh, a visual image. So it is always something that we uh, put onto, um, it, it's always, let's say, an interpretation, right? So I think nanotechnology really forces us to think about this. Uh, then there is the concept of hardness and softness. So we have seen this with um, all of those images of uh, nanobots that I've showed you before. And I think we really have an idea of, nano of technology that is uh, really um, focused on hardness. So we really think that technology uh, has to be made of hard materials assembled in a very rigid way. Um, and nanotechnology really challenges this because it forces us to um, use different kinds of materials and also these different kinds of organization. Um, and then, of course, complexity, because nanotechnology always deals uh, with multitudes of bodies. So we really never have a single nanoparticle. I mean, it, it can happen, but most of the time, uh, let's say we always deal with uh, a large amount of swarm of bodies altogether. And we really have to think about the way of this, uh, in which all of these different bodies interact with each other. So the problem of complexity really is at the heart of nanotechnology. 
and it really challenges the way we think about uh, technology today. Um, and I, also, I would like you to think about this, maybe also as we go through the lecture, in what ways can uh, nanomaterials really challenge our ideas of, um, of technology. Okay, so spider silk. Um, this uh, will be the model material for this lecture. It will be the first material that we encounter. Um, and I have chosen spider silk uh, for several reasons. Um, the first reason is that uh, spider silk really is um, a fascinating material. It really does have uh, incredible properties and I will talk about them a little bit more in detail. Uh, and I also think that spider silk is interesting because of the way uh, in which um, spiders uh, and the material that they produce have a very uh, symbiotic relationship. So you cannot really have a spider without the silk. So spiders really are defined as animals uh, by their capacity to produce silk in every stage of their life cycle. So they really are the only animal that produces silk at every stage of their life cycle. Um, and this is um, important because spiders really rely on silk for their survival. And uh, when they first emerged uh, 400 million years ago, spiders um, used the silk just for a very specific purpose for um, building shelters. Uh, but then uh, as evolution went on, uh, spiders started to diversify their production of silk. Uh, and now contemporary modern spiders can uh, produce up to seven different kinds of silk. Uh, and these silks um, are different both in their chemical structure and in their function. Uh, so, um, the, um, of course, the most well known kind of uh, spider silk is the one used for building the orb web, which is the vertical uh, spiral shaped web that uh, some spiders build. Uh, and to build this structure, uh, there are several, ki several kinds of silk uh, involved. Um, so we have uh, the most uh, important structural silk, which is the major ampullate silk, which is used to build uh, the main frame of, um, of, the, of the spider web. Um, then we have another type of silk, um, viscous kind of silk that is used to build the internal spiral of the spider web. Uh, and this silk um, is also covered with another kind of silk that is uh, sticky uh, and uh, it is a kind of sticky coating put over this spiral that uh, helps the spider to capture uh, its prey. Uh, and then there are uh, types of silk that are used for wrapping prey or uh, wrapping eggs. Uh, so in total, there are seven types of silk that really are optimized to uh, have a specific purpose and the chemical structure is optimized for each specific purpose. Um, so why is silk so uh, popular um, and what are its properties? So I think the most uh, well-known uh, aspect of spider silk is the mechanical strength. Um, I mean, everyone knows or has heard that spider silk is a really uh, one incredibly strong material. Um, and actually, it is true that spider silk is the strongest natural fiber that we know of. Uh, and the mechanical strength uh, really is defined as the uh, capacity of a material to uh, withstand uh, deformation, right? So um, without breaking. But there are um, different kinds of mechanical properties of a material, uh, and the strength is. Um, really uh, just one of these properties. Uh, and the aspect that really makes spider silk surprising uh, is uh, its uh, toughness. So its capacity to um, absorb a large amount of energy before breaking. Um, and uh, because of this incredible uh, aspect, um, I think uh, spider silk has always been kind of um, uh, in the, throughout history, we always try to extract and find ways to uh, use this material. Uh, and here you can see in this drawing uh, this uh, mechanism for extracting spider silk out of a spider. Uh, and this is still done today. Um, so you can find pictures online of this, uh, of spiders that are kind of uh, immobilized and the silk is pulled uh, from their bodies because 
um, creating artificial spider silks is not really easy, even though we can have the same uh, molecular uh, structure, so we can have the proteins of spider silk, um, we still don't know how to produce it in the exact same way, uh, because um, the spider really has, um, and we will talk about this, the capacity to um, help it, the silk to somehow self-organize in a very specific um, nanostructure. Uh, so here you can see how different kinds of silk have different kinds of properties. Uh, here the red line is the uh, silk that the, the feather uses to build the frame of the feather web. Uh, and you can see that this curve is very steep. So what does this mean? Uh, this, um, here on, on this axis, you, you, I have the strength, uh, so yeah, the, the stress, so you have the force uh, that the, the material opposes to the formation, and here you have the formation. So you can see here that um, if we have a, um, a large, we can have a large load, but the, uh, the, the material does not deform very much. So it is quite stiff, and it can really withstand a very strong impact. But the, um, the blue line, uh, which refers to the internal part of the spider web, has a different mechanical behavior. Here you can see that we can really deform this material very much without breaking, and it does not oppose very much strength to this deformation, but still it is able to really absorb uh, the, um, the, the impact and really absorb a lot of energy. And the, the reason for this is that, of course, this part of the spider silk of the spider web is used uh, to capture prey. So when you have a prey that really hits the, the spider web very fast, uh, we need a material that is able to process uh, all of these strengths uh, without, uh, without really breaking. Um, so why does the spider silk have these incredible mechanical properties? And to understand this, we really have to look about, we really have to look at uh, the um, chemical and uh, structural uh, aspects of spider silk. So um, spider silk really has uh, an interesting structure. Uh, it is composed of a hierarchical self-organized nanostructure. Uh, so what does it mean? That if we were able to really look uh, at the spider silk thread at different scales, we would see that at each scale we have a different type of uh, structural self-organization. So in the thread, um, so spider silk is a protein, um, but um, the, the, let's start from the bottom. <laughs> let's start from the from the uh, protein structure. I think it's the easiest part. Uh, it's the easiest way to explain this. So proteins are actually macromolecules, um, and you probably know this. And they are made of a specific chemical structure, but they are um, composed of uh, repetitive units, um, which are um, identified by some specific groups uh, attached to these repetitive units that make them uh, unique. So it's kind of ha it's, uh, like having Lego bricks, OK, or a, a puzzle pieces. And you can put them together. Each puzzle piece is a little different from the other, or they can be all the same. But they can be attached one to the other to produce long chains, uh, long molecular chains. Um, and uh, depending on the sequence of these chains, we have different behaviors of these molecules, different uh, structural organizations. Um, so um, starting from this, then um, these proteins are actually able in the spider silk thread to self-organize in different structures. And if we look at this, we have two kinds of structures inside of spider silk. There are some parts that are more ordered um, and more crystalline, uh, so they are rigid. It's like um, having a, a, a rigid part uh, inside, like, um, I don't know, a glass bead, so something that is not really easily deformable. Uh, and these uh, rigid parts are linked to uh, more flexible parts uh, that are actually able to be deformed. And this combination of hard parts and soft parts really makes uh, the spider silk, really gives the spider silk its um, incredible properties, its incredible mechanical properties. Um, and uh, let's say what is interesting here is that this structure really uh, is incredibly complex, but it is uh, produced in a fraction of a second um, in the moment uh, when the spider really pulls 
the thread outside of its body. So um, well, I think um, that spider silk really highlights this uh, aspect of self-assembly, self-organization. So it is really easy um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the spider to have this uh, incredible uh, and complex structure that self-organizes just in the fraction of, um, of a second in the moment where the spider pulls the material outside of, of its body. Um, so there are so many fascinating properties of spider silk, uh, and I will tell you about some of them. Uh, the first one, uh, as I have already mentioned, is this um, self-organization property. Uh, so we have been wondering, uh, scientists have been wondering about the reasons why um, the spider is, uh, manages to have this self-organization. And as I mentioned, uh, when we try to do this artificially, uh, we are not really as good as spiders uh, in doing this. Um, and uh, probably the reason why spiders are able to uh, have this process of self-organization uh, is the fact that um, spider silk is made of uh, molecules that are really sensitive to certain uh, stimuli. So they are um, really able to change their behavior depending on the environment. And this is an important concept that we will see several times. Uh, so um, the idea is that by changing the pH, uh, so the acidity of the environment, uh, these um, uh, molecules can really self-organize and form uh, some uh, strings uh, and uh, some specific structures that then compose the structure of the spider silk. Um, then another interesting aspect of spider silk uh, is uh, its interaction with uh, water, with uh, environmental humidity. Um, so this is another thing that makes the spider silk um, some, somewhat a smart material, an intelligent material. And it is the fact that by changing um, the humidity of the environment, uh, spider silk changes its behavior. There is this phenomenon called super contraction of spider silk, um, in which uh, basically when uh, a, a thread of spider silk is exposed to water, um, its properties, structural and mechanical properties really change. The um, uh, silk thread becomes much shorter uh, and uh, what happens is that it becomes much stiffer also. So it is really, um, it becomes stronger. And the idea here is that maybe uh, from an evolutionary perspective, the idea is that um, once uh, it rains, maybe uh, there is a much more need to protect the uh, spider web structure from uh, damage from wind, for example, or falling objects. So um, this response really helps spider to have um, a more structurally sound uh, environment. And then also this, um, the spider silk also has um, a kind of, uh, let's say, self-healing uh, capacity. So what does it mean? That once it is exposed to water, and then uh, after that, once it dries uh, in the sun, um, the spider silk is able to really repair some of the structural damage that um, it uh, has undergone during um, during the lifetime of the spider web, let's say. Uh, so really spider silk is able to respond to all sorts of uh, environmental stimuli and this really makes it uh, what I would define as a smart material. Um, another interesting thing, another interesting phenomenon that spider silk um, exhibits is uh, the phenomenon of hysteresis. And hysteresis is an interesting concept, I think. It is not interesting just for science. I think it can be interesting also from a more philosophical perspective. Um, and I think uh, it, it, hysteresis, let's say hysteresis can be defined as the capacity of a system uh, to change its response and its properties um, in response to its previous history. So it's, it's a kind of learning behavior that some uh, material system, uh, material systems, and not just material systems, also some, um, um, uh, let's say it, it also happens, for instance, in algorithms. So it, it's not really just related to uh, materials, but it is very common in materials. Um, and it is uh, somehow a learning capacity. So in the case of spider silk, what happens is that once um, the spider thread is, uh, the spider silk thread is formed, uh, in, as a result of, um, of an impact, of a very strong impact, the structure of this material really changes. Uh, and this 
structural change influence, influences the future behavior of the material in a way that, that really we could define as a form of learning. Um, and so what I would say uh, is that uh, hysteresis really is something that we can think about as a possible definition of intelligence, maybe. Uh, and we have a phenomena of hysteresis also in the, in the neural structures, uh, so within our own brains. Um, and um, I think that it really um, marks a difference from just a simple mechanical response. So we have just uh, a trigger and then a response, and the response is always the same, and a form of learning. Because if we can um, transform um, our previous experiences into some kind of structural change, then it means that uh, there is a form of, um, of learning or adaptation that uh, is really taking place. Okay, so um, another, uh, let's say, in the light of all of these uh, intelligent materials, uh, intelligent behaviors of the spider silk, um, the interesting question to me is, uh, what is the relationship of the spider with this incredible material that uh, it produces? Um, and there is an interesting paper um, that was published in uh, 2017 um, uh, in, in the field of, uh, let's say, animal cognition, and it suggests uh, that spiders um, have a relationship with their spider web that could be defined as extended cognition. Uh, and we will go to, um, a little bit more in depth in the definition of extended cognition and extended mind, although you probably already have heard of this because this is a very popular philosophical concept. Um, but it is interesting for me, um, uh, this paper was very interesting for me because it highlights some, uh, some important aspects of, um, of our relationship with, with materials. Um, so uh, the idea uh, of this paper is that um, spiders have learned uh, to deal with some evolutionary pressure uh, not by developing larger centralized um, uh, brains, but instead they learned to somehow transfer parts of this, um, let's say, selective pressure onto uh, an external material, which is the spider web, so that they can actually deal uh, with complex environments, not just uh, with their brains and with their nervous systems, but also with something else, with a form of uh, externalized material, which we could define as a technology, although maybe we could argue about this, whether the spider web is a technology or not. I think it is, but <laughs> maybe it, uh, we can discuss about this later. Uh, and um, the reason this uh, researchers suggest that uh, the, um, the relationship between the spider and the spider web is a form of extended cognition is the, what they call the mutual manipulability criterion, um, which suggests that uh, we can define um, extended cogn cognition on the basis of the fact that not only um, the spider uh, influences uh, the spider web, but there is also a retroactive effect where the spider web really influences the spider. So the, um, let's say the perception of the spider, uh, its uh, understanding of the environment and its experience of the world. So there is kind of this uh, two-way uh, interaction between uh, the animal and the material. And for this reason, we could really uh, think of this as a sort of uh, extended cognition. Um, so for example, what has been found is that uh, by manipulating the, the tension of the spider web thread, uh, we can also uh, impact the attention of the spider. So the spider will pay more attention to areas of the spider web where there is more tension in the field thread. Um, and on the other hand, the spider is of course able to change the tension of the spider web depending uh, on its needs. So if it is more hungry, it will um, of course have more tension in the spider web uh, so that he's able to perceive uh, more uh, accurately the presence of potential prey. Um, so in general, uh, the conclusion here is that web threads, so the silk threads cannot be understood just as passive transmitters of vibrational information, uh, but instead um, they uh, actually can process the same information in different and adaptive ways. So there is a kind of intelligence that is actually transferred onto this 
um, externalized material, let's say. Um, so the way that the spider uses this is not just as a perceptual tool, but also um, the spider uses its own web also um, as a um, form of actual thinking and as a form of uh, externalized memory. So instead of memorizing, um, uh, for instance, in the process of construction of the spider web, instead of memorizing every step of this construction process, which is very complicated because uh, actually the spider is building uh, something in a three-dimensional space and it is a very regular and very complex structure, and for instance, a human by itself uh, really would have a very hard time to build something like that. Um, and the, the spider really does not have a lot of long-term memory, doesn't really have a lot of brain power, let's say, but the spider silk uh, really uh, acts as a sort of uh, spatial, spatial memory, let's say, for the spider. Um, and in this way, really, again, part of the cognition of the spider really is transferred onto, uh, onto the material. Um, so yes, I would say that the spider web um, really, um, really uh, is a smart material, and not only it is a smart material, but uh, it really actively contributes to the intelligence of the animal that produces it. Uh, so for me, um, this was very interesting, and it had me thinking, uh, can we do the same thing with the materials that we produce? Can we establish the same relationship? And are we able to produce uh, by ourselves um, materials that are as smart as uh, the spider web, let's say? Um, so um, I think uh, we have one more hour to go. Um, and I would maybe have a small break, if you agree. And um, we can go back, come back here at, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think we have different time zones, but in 10 minutes, <laughs> and then go on with the seminar, uh, if, you, if everyone is good with that. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, now is a good time um, to have some, then we will also have a final discussion, but if you have any questions now, uh, then it's great. Okay, then um, I will see you in 10 minutes.
So when everyone is ready, we can start again. Okay, so um, we have uh, discussed a little bit about the spider, spider silk um, in the specific aspects of this uh, material, its physical chemical properties, its, um, the idea that it is possibly a smart material and the way it interacts with the mind of the spider. Um, so if we um, assume uh, or we want to suggest that uh, spider silk maybe is an intelligent material, uh, then the question uh, I think is uh, what does it mean um, uh, to, to, for a material to be intelligent um, and um, is there or are there ways in which we can also recreate uh, this kind of intelligence also artificially in an artificial system. Um, so we really have to think a little bit more about uh, maybe the concept of uh, intelligence itself in the context of uh, of materials. Um, so uh, I think we can uh, really start from the definition of the extended mind, um, which really, uh, as we have said, we have used this concept for the spider web and the relationship of of the spider with its uh, uh, with the silk. Um, and uh, here we have. Uh, the famous paper, uh, uh, quotation from the famous paper by uh, Nicola Arch and David Chalmers, The Extended Mind, which was written in 1998. Uh, and this is, of course, a very famous paper. And the main point here is the possibility of a mind to be uh, somehow externalized uh, onto some other uh, material supports. Um, so um, what Chalmers and Clark write um, is uh, in these cases, uh, the human organism is linked with an external entity in a two-way inter interaction, creating a coupled system that can be seen as a cognitive system in its own right. Um, all the components in the system play an active ca causal role, and they jointly govern behavior in the same sort of way that cognition usually does. If we remove the external component of the system's behavior, uh, the system's behavioral competence will drop, just as it would if we removed part of its brain. Our thesis is that the, this sort of coupled process counts equally well as a cognitive process, whether or not it is wholly in the head. Uh, what if people always carried a pocket calculator or had them implanted? The real moral of the portability intuition is that for coupled systems to be relevant to the core of cognition, reliable coupling is required. Um, it happens that most reliable coupling takes place within the brain, but there can easily be reliable coupling in the environment as well. So again, here the idea uh, is the possibility of a double uh, relationship, so a two-way uh, interaction between uh, our mind, our brain, or the spider's mind and brain, uh, and uh, the external structure or material on which part of this cognitive process is projected. So we find again this idea that the relationship really has to be uh, bi-univocal, let's say, um, and also um, the, the problem uh, that I find interesting that is underlined here uh, is the idea of um, the coupling between uh, our own uh, bodies and brains and uh, this externalized, um, externalized uh, cognitive support, let's say, or externalized material. Um, and I think this is interesting because uh, it's uh, really the question here um, is a question that concerns um, the interface in a way, and we will return on the concept of the interface uh, later on, but the problem uh, really seems to be um, how and in what way uh, we build a relationship with this technological or uh, external object uh, and what kind of surface there is between us and this object what kind of contact there is. So for me, um, it is interesting in the context of nanotechnology uh, and nanomaterials, because really, as we will see uh, later on, 
um, nanomaterials and nanotechnologies really have the possibility uh, of uh, extending the surface of interaction between um, themselves and us uh, and really creating very complex interfaces. Um, and this is really the case for spider silk. So not only spider silk is fundamental for the spider um, and it, the spider really cannot live without this material, but um, also because of its structure, spider silk really is able to sense the environment and it is able to do so because it is composed of a variety of a multitude of different elements that really have a very large surface contact with the outside world. So they really are able to uh, constantly be um, perceptive towards what the spider does and what happens in the environment. So I think this is a really interesting uh, aspect uh, that we can take from uh, this very famous lecture. Um, and, uh, but there are other perspectives uh, that can make us think uh, about, let's say, the intelligence of um, non-human objects or even non-living objects. So I think the focus for me and for the coming lectures will be not just uh, to discuss non-human intelligences, but uh, maybe also to focus on non-living materials because uh, we can all maybe agree to some extent uh, that, for instance, animals have a kind of cognition, uh, plants can have a kind of cognition, but how far can we extend this boundary and what does it mean for a non-living system um, to have a form of cognition? And what does it even mean for a, a material system to be living? So this is another question that we will deal with. Um, and I find the, an interesting position is the, the one that uh, Jane Bennett um, proposed in, in her book, Vibrant Matter, A Political Ecology of Things. And I really enjoyed this book and uh, maybe you, uh, you, would, uh, you would too, uh, if, you, if you are interested in this topic. Uh, but her idea uh, is really uh, to focus on the agency of non-living materials. So I think that the, there is a shift uh, if we uh, compare uh, what um, Clark and Chalmers say, um, which is a kind of a more uh, moderate position, I think, uh, to, to extend human cognition onto non-human objects is one thing. Uh, and another thing is to uh, think that uh, non-human, non-living material can actually have uh, a form of agency, then we are really pushing the boundary uh, a little bit further. Uh, and Jane Bennett says, uh, why speak of the agency of assemblages and not more modestly of their capacity to form a culture or self-organize or participate in effect? Uh, because the rubric of material agency is likely to be a stronger counter to human exceptionalism um, two, that is uh, the human tendency to understate the degree to which people, animals, artifacts, technologies, and elemental forces share powers and operate in dissonant conjunction with each other. No one really knows what human agency is or what humans are doing when they are said to perform as agents. Uh, in the face of every analysis, human agency remains something of a mystery. Uh, if we do not know just how it is that human agency operates, how can we be so sure that the processes through which non-humans make their mark are qualitatively different. So the idea here is, is um, really uh, there is also maybe um, um, a, a, a potentially political reason, and this is of course a political uh, analysis of the problem, why we could uh, or we want to attribute a form of agency to also non-living materials. Um, and I think this can be an interesting perspective considering also um, uh, the question of ecology, right? So uh, the way we relate to non-human and non-living materials uh, in the context, of, of course, of an ecological perspective. Um, so uh, let's go back uh, to the intelligence then of the material structures. Um, and uh, again, um, I would like to discuss a little bit with you uh, what it could mean for a material or a body uh, to be uh, intelligent. And uh, here I wanted to suggest the example uh, of, uh, actually this is a living organism, um, but again, it is a very unconventional uh, living organism. And uh, this organism is the Physarum polycephalum, uh, and um, uh, it, is, it belongs to the kingdom of the Fista, uh, although often it is called uh, slime mold. Uh, but it does not uh, belong to the kingdom of fungi. 
Um, so, um, yeah, it's kind of, but although it, it does look like a little bit like a mold. Uh, and this uh, organism is interesting because it is um, an acellular organism. So um, it's kind of unique. Uh, it's morphological, biological structure because um, it is not um, uh, multicellular in the sense that it is not really composed of a multitude of cells, but it um, has a multitude of nuclei um, included uh, within a single cellular membrane. Um, and uh, so it, just, it is not really um, monocellular, but not really multicellular either. Uh, and why, the reason why this material uh, has been so interesting um, and has attracted much attention uh, in the last uh, years uh, is its capacity somehow to solve uh, complex problems. So this organism does not, does not really have a brain, uh, of course, um, and um, it is a very simple, uh, simple organism by itself. It does not even have tissues of any kind, uh, but still um, there have been some experiments and here uh, on the right you can see uh, one of these uh, the most famous experiments that have proven the capacity of this organism to solve some very complex problems. So here you can see um, this organism, Cesarum polyce polycephalum, uh, that is slowly expanding um, uh, in, over uh, this uh, map uh, composed of these tiny white dots, and these white dots are uh, made of food for uh, this um, uh, for this organism, um, and um, what this organism does, it it, it expands, and then um, it is able to find uh, the most optimized path that connects all of these uh, different uh, dots. Um, and uh, this is actually a very complex uh, problem, a uh, complex op optimization problem that uh, would require really uh, a lot of um, demanding. Um, calculations on the, the um, for, for for example for a computer a lot of uh, time uh, and um, and energy to solve this problem but this animal that uh, this animal this organism that is so simple is able to do this uh, so naturally and um, these uh, dots are com are positioned um, in the positions uh, corresponding to the uh, map of Tokyo uh, and these positions are somehow the most important spot. Uh, in the city of Tokyo, uh, and by connecting all of these spots, um, what the what, what the, the slime mold was able to do was to reproduce the map uh, of the Tokyo um, subway system. Uh, so it was able to actually find the most uh, optimal way to uh, create a complex network. Um, so um, and here you can see it is able to of course uh, go through a maze. Uh, and find the shortest path out of a maze. So um, why uh, is uh, this organism so intelligent uh, and what does this have to do with all we have said so far? Um, clearly, uh, this um, organism is able to show a kind of uh, intelligence that is very different compared to um, the kind of the intelligence that we are used to think of um, because it is it does not possess a centralized a control system, let's say, but um, it is able to solve complex problems uh, just by, um, let's say, performing a multitude of um, a, a very large amount of, let's say, very simple uh, operations, right? So it is um, delocalized and decentralized, and by uh, simply uh, perceiving uh, with uh, the cellular membrane that encloses it. Uh, the signals from the environment, and this is cellular membrane, it is a very active uh, surface, it is a very rich and active interface, uh, it is able to perceive uh, its environment, um, and uh, on each uh, small part of this surface there are receptors that are able to understand what is going on, um, and by a simple, uh, let's say, repetition of a large amount uh, of simple mechanisms, we are able to obtain the emergence of uh, intelligent behavior, intelligent behavior. So here maybe um, we can uh, try to understand, even though this is a living organism and it's not, uh, let's say, a, um, a non-living nanomaterial, but the, the way in which, uh, for instance, spider silk exhibits intelligence and other 
uh, nanomaterials exhibits intelligence is very similar to this um, in, a, in the sense that there is not really a control uh, central unit uh, that is uh, giving instructions to the material structures to uh, do a certain thing. Uh, so there is not really a processing of information uh, from the environment in a centralized structure. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a multitude of different structures um, that um, somehow uh, produce uh, the emergence of intelligent behavior. So uh, in this sense, uh, we can say uh, that uh, intelligence can be understood in this case um, as the result of, um, um, of complexity, so of the complexity of a, of a material system. Um, so um, we have similar behaviors um, that take place uh, also uh, in artificial systems. Uh, and uh, there is a whole field of nanotechnology uh, and material science that deals with smart materials. Uh, and smart materials are materials that are able to respond to environmental stimuli. Um, and uh, again, for instance, um, here on the left, you see an example of one of the first smart materials that have been invented. Uh, and this is a safe memory alloy. Uh, and it, it is a material that is able to remember. It's the same remember its shape um, uh, that it was given uh, in a certain state. Uh, and then um, it can always return that state uh, as, a uh, as a response to a thermal uh, trigger. Um, so uh, once it is heated, it always returns to its original shape. Um, so again, this is an example of hysteresis, so the same phenomenon that we have seen taking place um, in uh, the case of spider silk, and it is a kind of a recurring uh, idea in smart materials, so the idea of somehow learning something, let's say, uh, and I understand that this is a very simple form of learning, but maybe we, we can still see um, uh, in a very primitive way some uh, aspects of intelligence that we really find than in more complex systems. Um, there are several types of smart materials, uh, and we could talk about this forever because we have materials that really respond to all sorts of, um, of stimuli uh, from um, uh, electric fields to magnetic fields to chemical uh, signals. And this is particularly interesting for me. So we have materials that are able to change in response to the presence of a certain molecule. So they have a sort of sensing uh, ability. Uh, and uh, this, the presence of a molecule can trigger a certain behavior. And this is similar to what we have seen with Pitarum polycephalum. Uh, so this uh, organism responds to the presence of uh, a certain uh, chemical signal in the environment and then moves and changes in response to that. And we have artificial materials that can actually do that. Uh, we have artificial materials that respond to heat, to light. Um, here uh, on, on the right, uh, there is an example of a smart material that is uh, interesting for me. Uh, again, here we have a form of learning, let's say. Um, and this is a, um, an interesting material, a composite material, uh, that um, basically it is able uh, to uh, grow and change in response to repeated uh, mechanical uh, stimulation. Um, in the same way that our muscles grow. Uh, so by repeatedly uh, extending uh, and contracting this material, um, the same way you would train your muscles, uh, you can obtain a material that has in increased strength, uh, right? So we can really uh, somehow engineer uh, inside of artificial materials all sorts of um, responses uh, from environmental stimuli. And this is interesting because it can really change the way uh, I think we deal with um, with technologies, right? Because we are used to thinking uh, of technological objects as somewhat passive, um, but still um, we have maybe the possibility of thinking about uh, technologies that actually change in the same way that we do and sense the environment in the same way that we do. And then this could help us really establish um, and also extend our perception and our cognition of uh, the environment that surrounds us. Um, so defining a smart material is not easy, uh, but uh, in general, we can agree that there are three aspects of this. Um, there is a part of sensing, a part of 
controlling and uh, a part of actuating, let's say. So um, in a way, um, there must be a component on this, on this material system that is able to perceive something in the environment. Um, then the part of the control is kind of, I'm not sure control is really the right word, but uh, somehow there must be a form of processing this information, uh, I would say in the form of structural change. So again, uh, I would go back to the concept of hysteresis here to think about the way um, in which um, material systems can uh, learn from their past uh, previous um, experiences uh, and somehow uh, incorporate uh, this in the form of a structural change. And then there must be the possibility of acting somehow as a result of, uh, of, this, um, of this sensing uh, capacity, this sensing ability. Um, okay, so um, uh, I think like now we will go a little bit uh, uh, off track, uh, but I think this is uh, still relating to what we are talking about. Um, because uh, for me, um, the question here uh, is really um, how and what kind of relationship can we build uh, once we um, understand uh, that we can really deal with um, intelligence uh, materials or materials and bodies that really have a form um, of, um, of cognition, like, uh, like maybe we do, or maybe a different one, uh, but uh, how does this impact uh, our experience of the world uh, and really how can we build um, a productive uh, interaction with uh, these technologies um, and yeah, in this um, uh, thinking about this for me uh, it was really useful uh, reading uh, Karen Barad uh, maybe you've heard of her uh, but uh, she is a philosopher that has uh, worked uh, in deep connection uh, with uh, quantum physics and quantum mechanics uh, and has used some concepts from physics and quantum mechanics to uh, really reflect uh, about um, um, our relationship uh, with the scientific uh, objects uh, and also the, let's say more in general, the ontology of scientific objects uh, and of bodies in general. Um, and in this uh, paper, uh, Karen Barad, uh, Nature's Queer Performativity, performativity um, Karen Barad discusses um, Niels Bohr uh, complementarity principle, um, which was first uh, elaborated in 1927. Um, and I will talk about this a little bit. Um, so uh, the complementarity principle um, really uh, focuses on the idea uh, that uh, bodies quantum objects, let's say, um, are not really, um, uh, their identity cannot really be separated from the identity of uh, the um, uh, instrumental setup that we use uh, to observe them, to look at them. Uh, and here we can see this, for instance, uh, in the case of um, the, a famous experiment in quantum mechanics, uh, which was first formulated as a thought experiment, the double slit uh, experiment um, in which we can see that electrons, uh, when they pass through a single slit, um, they really behave just as uh, simple particles. Uh, but uh, when they go through a double slit, they produce an interference pattern. So then they behave as waves. So the question here is what are they? Um, and um, the, the, the answer to this question um, for, uh, for Karen Barad and for Niels Bohr is that really we cannot uh, really separate the, the instrument uh, from, the, um, uh, from the identity of the object that we are looking at. Um, and really there is an inseparability between the object and uh, the instrumental apparatus. Um, so, um, I think that uh, this is really interesting, uh, also outside of the context of uh, quantum mechanics. So Karen Bad says, uh, on my agential realist account, all bodies, not merely human bodies, come to matter through the world's performativity. Um, it's iterative interactivity. Matter is not figured as a mere effect or product of discursive practices, 
but rather as an agentive factor in its iterative materialization and identity and difference are radically reworked. Phenomena are entanglements of space and matter, not in the colloquial sense of a connection or intertwining of individual entities, but rather in the technical sense of quantum entanglements, um, which are the ontological inseparability of agentially interacting components. Uh, the notion of interaction, in contrast to the usual interaction, which presumes the prior existence of independent entities, um, marks uh, an important shift, reopening and refiguring foundational notions of classical ontology, such as causality, agency, space, time, matter, discourse, responsibility, and accountability. Um, so uh, for me, this concept of interaction really um, is interesting, has been interesting to think about um, in the context of uh, chemical synthesis, um, because the way uh, in which uh, as scientists and as humans, I would say, we produce the materials that we use, um, to me, uh, is really interesting from uh, an epistemological perspective, let's say. Um, so what I find uh, interesting about spiders, for example, is really uh, the fact um, that uh, they have a really intimate relationship with the production process of the silk uh, in the way that uh, this material that they produce is not really uh, different from their, is separated from their bodies and not really separated from their own minds. Um, and I think that uh, when I go into the laboratory, when uh, scientists and humans in general produce uh, and create a new material, uh, what happens is not simply um, the um, uh, imposition from the human point of view uh, of a shape to a passive and really not uh, responsive uh, matter, but on the other hand, there is a kind of um, intermingling and uh, mixing of uh, two different things, right? So there is a really the, the creation of an interface between the human and the non-human material in the way that, uh, for instance, chemical synthesis really depends um, not just on what uh, me as a chemist uh, I want to do, but also on the possibilities that uh, the material structure that I am dealing with uh, is opening uh, to me. Um, and really what this material can do uh, by itself, um, independently of what I want to do with this material. So really, uh, I think that in the process of chemical synthesis, in the process of the creation of a new material, there is really a form of uh, intra-activity, what I would define also as a form of intra-activity. Uh, so since we have been talking about interfaces, uh, I think we uh, can really go a bit more in depth into what an interface is. Uh, and um, I would say that the interface for me is really a guiding concept, uh, although, um, still it is not easy for me to give an, a single definition of what an interface is, because I think that interfaces really um, are a concept that exists on different levels, let's say. Uh, so there is a more basic level um, in which we can think of interfaces only uh, even just from a material and scientific perspective. Uh, and this is already uh, a very deep uh, scientific concept. So we can think of interfaces as a material um, space uh, in material science and what we can do uh, on interfaces um, and how we can act technologically on interfaces. And then uh, there is the interface um, in the most, I think, common uh, sense. Um, so the interface between human and technology. So usually we think of the interface in this way um, as the device that puts the human mind in connection with the technology. And this is also a whole um, uh, interesting and complex aspect. Uh, so I think we can start from the more scientific side of things. So interfaces, the interface uh, is really a concept um, in chemistry uh, that is very specific and very technical, but also very interesting. So in chemistry and material science in general, and in physics, I would say, um, interfaces um, are material regions where different bodies to different bodies or phases of matter enter into a reciprocal interaction. 
Um, and you can see here on the left this drawing of an interface. Um, and uh, you can see on more on the left, uh, we have a um, simplified model of the interface. So phi uh, one, the blue face, um, and phi two, the yellow face, are separated by a rigid boundary. Uh, and uh, there is, let's say, uh, this um, uh, virtual um, abstract line that really divides two bodies. And it is, uh, of course, immaterial because it is, um, let's say, uh, infinitely thin, right? So it is, it is just um, a boundary that we can draw and say, okay, here begins uh, one material and here it ends and begins the next one. Um, and on the other side, we have, um, and, and we can also see the physical properties, of course, of, this mat of these materials are different and there is a sharp uh, separation between the two. Um, and then on the other side, we have a more realistic view of the interface, a more complex um, and more uh, accurate representation of the interface, where um, actually these two materials um, are not separated by a rigid boundary, but, it's, but still they are, instead they are mixing together and form um, a hybrid space uh, in between them. Uh, and this is really what happens um, in chemistry uh, when we think about the surface between two materials. Um, so the interface is not just the end of a material uh, and the beginning of the next, but it is a space when, uh, where two materials can communicate with each other and influence each other and change each other. Uh, and I think, for instance, the, um, um, probably the most simple but effective example of the interface for me uh, is the water droplet. Um, and you can see here uh, we have the same water droplet uh, on different uh, surfaces. And we can see that uh, the behavior of this droplet uh, changes um, depending on the surface it is in contact with. Um, in a way um, that um, uh, is, of course, uh, to us it can be can seem obvious because depending on uh, the chemical properties of each surface, of course, we expect a different interaction. But this really um, exemplifies for me the idea of the interface because if we would um, if we were able to look at the molecular structure of water in contact with this surface, we would see uh, that uh, the behavior, really the, or the organization of water molecules inside this boundary uh, really changes a lot depending on, um, on uh, the, su the substrate uh, that is on the other side. So uh, the interface really becomes um, a material space that has a volume that can be identified and also um, we can act uh, on the interface. It is not uh, simply a line, but it is a space where we can uh, be and we can also act technologically. So we can really change the surfaces and we can, of course, change the behavior of this droplet in um, uh, many different possible ways, right? So I think this really uh, captures the idea of the interface from a chemical perspective. On the other hand, uh, interfaces in today's technology, uh, how do we think of interfaces today? And I think uh, there is um, kind of a misconception uh, concerning um, interfaces, or maybe there is a tendency, let's say, of um, thinking of the interface as something that becomes increasingly immaterial and uh, thin and invisible. Um, we think of the interface as something that really uh, needs to uh, become uh, imperceptible. So we, in the, uh, in the ideal case, uh, in our interaction, for instance, with electronic technology, we uh, would not even notice uh, that the interface uh, is there. Uh, and this is really a big tendency and a big trend and uh, in the contemporary technology, right? And I have been thinking about this, for instance, um, in the last weeks after the announcement of Meta from Facebook and virtual reality. Uh, so the idea that really we need to be completely immersed into the technological space without even realizing that there is a separation or that there is a space of mediation, let's say, because it is not just separation, it is a form of mediation between us and the technological body and it is a space of communication, right? Um, so this uh, idea that um, some technologies are immaterial and that the interface is immaterial. Of course, it is a 
um, wrong, but uh, it is also, I think, in many ways, a dangerous uh, way to think about uh, technology because it really leads us to ignore um, the fact that every technology that we deal with actually has um, a material interface and that this material interface um, also is uh, sometimes problematic and we have to think about that. For instance, uh, all of the uh, materials and uh, that, that we use uh, to access a technology so I'm thinking about uh, rare earth metals that we that are fundamental for us, of course, to use electronic technologies. Uh, or I am thinking of the impact uh, or the carbon footprint of uh, artificial intelligence. So there is a lot um, that we don't realize, but uh, every interface actually is uh, deeply material. And I think we have to decide whether we want to see this interface or we just want to hide it, but that does not. Um, cancel it, I think. Um, and uh, so what about nanotechnology? Nanotechnology really deals with interfaces uh, in an interesting way. Uh, the defining aspect of nanotechnology uh, is the fact that um, nanomaterials really have a very large extensive uh, surface. Uh, and you can maybe understand this by looking at this example here with the purple cube. Uh, so if we have um, a single purple cube, <laughs> a single cube of one centimeter um, for each side, um, the total surface area of this cube will be six centimeters squared, so a very small area. But if we decided to take the same cube and we divide it into smaller cubes uh, made of one, uh, of one millimeter in size, then we would have a total area for the same amount of volume, we would have a total area of 60 centimeters squared. And if we decide to divide the same cube into one nanometer squared, then um, we would have into one nanometer size um, cubes, then we would have a total surface area of 60 million centimeters squared. So um, the surface area becomes exponentially larger once we reduce uh, the size of things. And this um, is the reason why nanotechnology really is the science of interfaces. What gives um, nanotechnology its power is precisely the possibility of making uh, interfaces um, much more large and much more complex also. So with nanotechnology, the interface becomes a, a space of technological action. Um, and um, there is, of course, an aspect of, uh, I would say, biomimicry in, in this concept, because biological structures often um, are um, organized in the same way. So, so uh, they uh, deal with very, very large surfaces. So we, our bodies, our cells are composed of many uh, different uh, structures, uh, each of which is in a very complex uh, chemical and physical interaction with all the other parts. And this is made possible uh, only because of uh, surfaces. Um, and it is because of surfaces that we are really able to have such a large amount of, uh, let's say, information in such a small amount of matter. Um, and really for this reason, I think that now technology can offer and does offer um, some a somewhat um, alternative paradigm for technology. So on the one hand, we have electronic devices going in the direction of the, making the interface even uh, more invisible and thinner and flat and simple. And on the other hand, we have now technology pushing in the direction of making interfaces larger and more complex um, and deeper, let's say. Uh, and this is not to say that nan nanotechnology uh, will save us all from, from all of our problems, but uh, it is a way to uh, think of technology in a different way and following a different paradigm. Um, and we see this also in all the examples that we have seen, like the spider web. Again, the reason why the spider silk is so intelligent is a matter of interfaces. It is uh, because um, it has a structure that is so complex that it can really produce a large amount of interactions. And these interactions can result in a large amount of, let's say, emergent uh, properties. So here I have reported some um, quotes from uh, a book by Brandon Hookway called Interface. <laughs> and this is a very interesting book. The book it deals really with the concept of the interface, very 
specifically, and I think uh, that uh, Hukwei has some very interesting points on the um, concept, the philosophical concept of the interface. Um, I like the idea that the interface is intended as a form of relation. Um, so it is not really uh, something, but it is the relation between something. Um, so the interface is a form of relation that obtains between two or more distinct entities, conditions, or states, such that it only comes into being as these distinct, distinct entities enter into an active relation with one another. Um, and also, uh, not only there is a, so there is, uh, the interface kind of exists in this boundary where um, it can exist only through the separation of bodies, but um, it uses this separation as a form of, uh, or to channel a form of interaction and a form of transmission and communication. So it results always in a unified condition, uh, but it does not really uh, eliminate the difference between bodies. So I think this is an interesting point. Um, and uh, of course, as Hukwe says, uh, interfaces have a lot of implications for notions of control and intelligence, as we have seen, I think, because uh, we have seen intelligent systems based on uh, in interfaces and interacting uh, surfaces. Uh, and also we have seen how interfaces really um, uh, make us ask the question of what it means um, to control um the development of a certain structure right um so the here i think there is an interesting point relating to um the processes of subjectification um uh, the, the subject of the interface uh, writes hukwe finds as its counterpart the user of the interface um, just as the user's learning or mastery of the interface is at the same time a kind of subjectification that the user of the interface is also its subject, follows the notion of the interface um, as that which at once separates and draws together in augmentation. Likewise, agency or the will and means to action is a capacity at once mediated by and produced upon the interface. So I think here there is another point um, that is interesting and it is the idea that uh, the interface with technology in this case is what uh, produces us as subjects um, and again, I think this is something to think about, and maybe we will focus on this also in the coming seminars when we will discuss about um, nanomedicine or human nanotechnology interfaces, uh, because again, there is a challenge here, I think, to the conventional idea of technology and the user being um, separated and retaining its own identity in respect to technology instead of being uh, changed through the process of technological action. Um, and again, here Hukwe points out uh, what we were discuss discussing before. So the idea that now there is a tendency towards making interfaces more transparent and making them disappear somehow. But again, um, he thinks, and I agree with him also on this point that the interface uh, always uh, requires an extraction of work and there is a cost to the construction of an interface. And he um, understands this cost in, the ter in terms of uh, thermodynamics. So if you're interested, you should definitely read the rest of the book uh, because he really goes in depth into this uh, idea. Uh, but I think that this is true, not only of course, from a thermodynamic perspective, but also it is true uh, from a conceptual perspective, right? So there, we cannot really make the interface between us and technology completely disappear. We cannot make it uh, arbitrarily um, invisible. Um, yes, uh, so I have a couple more things to discuss. I'll try to be quick because I think we are running out of time. Uh, and yeah, for next time, I will uh, try to uh, adjust a little bit more, uh, but we also had a long introduction. So, um, so uh, again, I wanted here to talk a little bit about the idea of softness. Maybe uh, we can return on this on, in the next lectures since we don't have much time but I will be a little fast on this and uh, tell you the main ideas. Um, so um, here you can see um, in, the bottom, uh, in the bottom left, some pictures of 
um, representing some uh, fibers uh, from um, uh, which were found in 2020, and they were uh, woven by uh, Neanderthal men. So they are from uh, around 90,000 years ago, uh, and this is a proof uh, somehow that weaving is one of the most ancient technologies for humanity, uh, and not only for humanity, because uh, Neanderthals are not uh, uh, homo sapiens like us. So really, we are dealing with something uh, very ancient that has defined us as humans for a very long time. So for me, the question is, uh, why don't we think of weaving as the most important technology? Why do we always think about uh, the Stone Age, for example, and we never think about the Fabric Age or something like that? So I think there is um, um, a sort of um, misconception and misunderstanding of technology, and maybe there is some um, prejudice uh, with respect to uh, soft technologies. We tend to prefer uh, to think of technology in terms of hard materials, hard structures, um, and this hardness is not simply relating to um, the materials uh, that we use to build the technology, but also to the approach of building technologies. Um, and I think weaving is kind of the most uh, important um, and it's kind of it, the, the paradigm of soft technology. And if, yeah, I think that nanotechnology really has drawn from some concepts relating to weaving um, to um, build somehow the, the view, its view of technology. Uh, because uh, in the same way uh, of weaving, um, nanotechnology really uses uh, relational and complex structures. Um, and also, uh, as we see in weaving, there is an, an entanglement of matter and information because the, um, the weaving also can incorporate within a material structure a lot of complex patterns um, that are really um, entangled with the material structure that we are talking about. And this is the same for nanotechnology. Um, there is a form of intelligence, uh, both in the structure of the of weaving of the fabric and a form of intelligence in the, in the structure of nanomaterials. But both of these uh, forms of intelligence are really um, uh, decentralized and they do not imply um, a form of, uh, let's say, active representation. Uh, and instead, they rely on uh, complexity uh, and a bottom-up approach to the control of complexity. Uh, so I think that these two technologies really have a lot in common. Uh, and nanotechnology is, let's say, the new uh, paradigm for soft technology in the same way that weaving uh, has been. Uh, and maybe I will tell you a little bit more about softness and hardness uh, in the next uh, session. I will try to kind of reorganize everything um, because I really care about this concept, but we don't really have uh, enough time to, to go through this now. Uh, so I will tell you a little bit about soft robots, uh, maybe next time. <laughs> uh, and um, yes, so just to conclude, um, we have talked about spiders and our relationship with technology. What I want to say, um, for me, the myth of Arachne, maybe you know this myth, um, has been a really fascinating story. Uh, and it is the story uh, of a woman, um, Arachne, this uh, ancient Greek weaver, um, that uh, was transformed into a spider as a punishment uh, for, um, uh, for being uh, so good at weaving even better than the, the goddess um, Athena, uh, which then was very envious of her and transformed her into a spider. Uh, but to me, this transformation process has always been a fascinating thing, an interesting thing, uh, because I think it really um, uh, is an example of the production of a sort of interface um, between uh, men and technology um, in a way that there is a, in this myth a complete uh, fusion of the human body with the technological body. Um, so Arachne and uh, her loom uh, somehow are merged into a single uh, body and they form a very deep and continuous interface. Uh, and I think this is an interesting idea. This is an interesting possibility to really rethink 
our approach to technology and to think of technology as something that can really uh, change us um, and redefine our own identity in a, in a way that our identity is uh, really constructed at the interface with technology. And I think uh, that it is not um, a really a coincidence that this myth talks about weaving, that it talks about spiders, that it talks about uh, nanomaterials in a way, because I think that really nanotechnology is uh, maybe a way that we can or, or offers us new perspectives to really change our approach um, to, to technologies. So um, I had some questions for you, um, but uh, maybe you also have questions for me. So maybe we can use these last minutes to have um, uh, a discussion or I would like to answer some of your questions. Um, and yeah, uh, and also if you have any observation or comment, uh, if this was too technical or boring or anything, please tell me because it is the first time that I do this and uh, it is really useful so that I can adjust also for the coming seminars. Thank you, Alan. Hi. Uh, can I can I ask you something? Is is about? I, I, are you hearing me? Is okay my my audio? Great. Um, so somebody, so sorry, I cannot hear you, but probably it is my problem. Wait. Okay. Oh, um. Let's see. Okay, no, yes, sorry, can you repeat? I think uh, yeah. I have my, uh, yeah. Are you hearing? Yeah, 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 I can hear you now. Uh, so it, it's it's about a, a question on the interaction thing. Yeah. I, I, I was uh, really interested in that in the, in the quantum, uh, quantum physics kind of a, a concept. And since uh, the, the interface, is where different bodies enter into this interaction mm -hmm. while kind of uh, retaining or upholding some kind of uh, uh, properties to each other. For example, material A, material B has this uh, proper, pro, uh, properties, uh, unique properties, and they then they have this area that the it, it kind of a uh, kind of a, a mix right uh properties in the, the this so i was thinking about how could we be a uh, interface if these uh materials kind of uh change each other and i i i, I don't know I, i'm really like uh, thinking uh aloud and kind of uh it, yes. it, I, I don't know if it even if it does exist, but I, 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 I mean, do, do you have some kind of, uh, have you thought about this or do you have kind of example uh, on this, I don't, I don't mean, con maybe in condensed matter physics, uh, I, I, I don't know that if they could uh, change each other in the same way that the instrument changed the, the, the object while also measuring. Right. Um, yeah, I think it is interesting because, um, of course, when we talk about interfaces, we, we tend to think of um, the surface between two things that already have their own identity. And I think the example in quantum mechanics is a bit more radical because we have something that really does not have any identity or it does not seem to have it be before. It's not chronological, of course, but it is like epistemologically before the encounter with the instrument with the apparatus. Um, I don't know, but I think uh, that there are some, uh, one thing I, I could think about, uh, maybe I would think about it a bit better for the next seminar, but uh, even a simple uh, situation uh, such as the um, crystal formation, the process of crystal formation, for example, uh, is something that is um, kind of uh, reminds me of this uh, situation where um, the emergence of a crystal from a um, saturated solution of, um, uh, of 
um, uh, of molecules um, of, or of a substance uh, really um, involves uh, the continuous, uh, let's say, negotiation between uh, um, the identity of the crystal that is forming and uh, the more disorganized state on the outside. And really, in this process of formation, the surface becomes the defining space space uh, where the object uh, becomes something that before it was really not. Uh, so this is something that comes to mind. And I think also, um, yeah, I, I, I think also uh, Gilbert Simondon has used this example. Uh, and I haven't talked about him, but maybe I can find the passage for you and then send it to you because it was uh, also interesting for me to read that. Um, in, um, in, yeah, and it really, I think, is a possible example of this. We, we have time for one more question. And yes. then we'll presentations. Uh, can I talk? Sure. Uh, hi, I'm amazed by your class, um, your seminar. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was thinking about um, the idea of, uh, of interface and it reminds me a little bit also of uh, well, I mean maybe it's a more philosophical approach to the interface and the idea of the camera obscura by Willem Flusser. So he takes the idea of the photograph photographical device, the photographical camera as a camera obscura where you don't know exactly uh, what's happening, even though you know what's happening, but um, it says something that uh, there's a kind of contradiction of the photographic camera, photographical camera as it's a set of given actions. And even the hacks are all of them given by the apparatus. So sometimes I think there's a, a maybe I, I'm, I'm I don't know if I'm doing the, the correct interpretation, but it seems like the, there's a conceptual well, or, or a, a behavior that it's already given by some interfaces or some apparatus uh, that doesn't allow allow us to think on a, a more agential way of uh, of interface, something like that. I was thinking. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. I really understood completely what you mean. Uh, but maybe um, I, if if I understood like correctly. Your point uh, is that uh, somehow, especially when we talk about uh, experimental apparatus, for, for example, that this experimental apparatus already is somehow um, uh, contains some boundaries and uh, is already uh, full of uh, a lot of uh, maybe um, also theoretical assumptions. Like one thing I, I think about in when I mm, when I think of um, yeah, experiment, like it is the case for the experiment of Bohr and it is the case for all sorts of experimental scientific apparatuses that, and also for photography, I think that really um, uh, what the is instruments that we use uh, really um, uh, impact the results that we obtain and really somehow uh, are not neutral, let's say. So there is no really, um, there's no, not a neutral measuring apparatus, but uh, we always um, have, um, of course, an influence uh, from the instruments onto the, the, the material uh, or the object that we are looking at. Uh, and of course, we have to keep this in mind uh, because also there are some uh, discursive aspects of this. So maybe there are some um, ideas that we already are putting inside our uh, in instrumental apparatus or experiments that really uh, then have an effect on uh, then on the identity or, or the result that we obtain, and this is a really human element. Um, so I agree with you. Uh, and uh, yes, on the other hand, I also think uh, that really, um, yeah, as you say, you know, interfaces really uh, have um, are the the, the uh, interfaces really are also full of um, our human ideas, right? And they are not just simple um, material configuration. I mean, they are, but they are also uh, linguistic uh, devices, let's say. And I, I like to think of them in this way, like not really as neutral um, as neutral uh, aspects of technology. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure if I really replied to you, but maybe um, 
I would think yeah. about this a bit more. Yeah, I was thinking about the, bond the boundaries of the, of the apparatus that would allow us the relation or some, yeah, something like that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry for the other questions, but maybe we can do them uh, next time. Um, so I can reply maybe at the beginning of the next seminar. Um, we can go back on your questions. And also, I, I will also uh, reply uh, to Dahu next time. Uh, thank you for the questions. Very interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, Lauren, a uh, question about um, so for the presentations, are there specific ones that you really want people to do for um, like specific readings? So it's going to uh, highlight them. Actually, um, honestly, for me, uh, I, since I don't know what everyone is interested in, uh, really anything can be can be good. And uh, if you have uh, doubts or questions, to, I'm telling the students they can write to me and ask me. Uh, I don't know, send me their suggestions. Maybe you have already made the groups. Um, yes. Okay, good. I so maybe, yeah, we can. If you have doubts for uh, for the texts and you don't know what to pick or you aren't sure if what you decided is a good idea, you can ask me. But for me, you are really free. And I think anything uh, is interesting from the materials of the course or also outside of, of the materials of the course, uh, really. And uh, yeah, we can okay. also start from the next seminar for, with some presentations if there is the option. Or, um. And I just want to note again, sorry, um, yeah. on the grading um, with, with doing a presentation, as long as you are attending and you have participation, we attend all four sessions, but you just do the presentation, you still get a pass, it'll be 60%. Um, so, but like you can get an exceptional if you put in your final paper, your final work. Um, and have a presentation set up in the next 48 hours, I'll put a reminder in. Okay. Um, any, sorry, any technical questions? I, I will send this PowerPoint, I will put this PowerPoint presentation onto the drive of the course so everyone can access it and have it if, in case you, you want to see it again. Uh, and yeah, that's it. I um, and I'll have the timestamps in the next 48 hours. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording.